the procedures that you had created within the ministry. Yes. And that procedure was in the way that files would move from, well, when they receive from the police to move to the DPP, etc., until it gets to you. Can we go back to the point of where you said it gets to the DPP and then he reviews, etc.? Yes. Further, before we continue, at some point I will request that you be looking at me more because we're communicating yes. instead of the yeah. commissioners. Uh, yes. So that way in that aspect we don't yes. talk over each other. Yes. Thank you. You may continue. Sorry, I didn't hear you. You may continue. Oh, um... I wanted you to go back to where you talked about the file being at the DPP and then moving over before it gets to you. No, I think I was done with that. I said usually um, it would come to me once, the, once they completed their opinion and the DPP would annotate on the, on the opinion sheet that was presented by the council who prepared the opinion and then he would mean it to SG and then SG would review it and then send to me. So usually, I think the point I was trying to raise is that if I did not agree with the opinion of the DPP or the opinion that was presented, uh, under the SG, sorry. Uh, yeah, the, the role of the DPP would now to convince us to why there is a need to prosecute or not to prosecute. Given my oversight role, I just need to make sure that he knows, he has the requisite evidence to prosecute that case because he would take responsibility for it. And what I had also concluded in saying is that no matter what happened before a case is prosecuted, the law and the facts have to, there has to be reasonable case for that, for that prosecution of that case. Yes. Thank wow. you. If I may take you back a bit. In your statement, in your testimony, you stated that. From the DPP, the file goes to the Solicitor General. Is that correct? Is that a procedure that's created by law? No, because when I assumed office, the, the procedure was automatically, once he has, when he, he's completed his opinion, he will come straight to me, to my office, to approve or not to approve. At that point, I'll write to refer you to the Constitution. If you may look at Section 85.4. And if you could read it out, please. In the exercise of his or her function under this section, the Director General of, sorry, the Director of Public Prosecution shall be subject to the direction and control of the Attorney General. Yes. Your mic, uh, Council. Yeah. <coughs> Section 85.4 of the Constitution yes. states that the Director of Public Prosecution shall have, in the exercise of his or her function under this section, the, direct, the Director of Public Prosecution shall 
be subject to direction or control of the Attorney General? Yes. I think then that means that the procedure you met at the Attorney General's chambers when you assume office was correct. Meaning yes, it's, it's the law, it's the law, but I had a policy in place. It's my office, so I, ha I create policies as well. I'm sorry to say, but policies cannot override law. So maybe you should have maintained Actually, again, the procedure. Because, sorry. <laughs> maybe not talk over each other. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Maybe you should oh. have maintained the procedure that you met there because that is what the law stipulated. I disagree because even though we have laws in place, but you also have procedures and policies that guide you in the implementation of that law. So I. I Yes. So I put in place that policy just for the Solicitor General to serve as a check for me. Because two heads are better than one. Mr. Ngati, I believe earlier on in your testimony, you already explained the capacity, the quality, the experience that the DPP needs to have. I did. And I think further, uh, well, the Constitution now. also does stipulate the experience the capacity, the quality that the Attorney General needs to obtain to have to hold that position. So therefore, I'm sure that's why the law provided that the two heads, which is the Attorney General and the DPP, should be enough to make a decision. There's nothing wrong to adding a third head as well, just to be doubly sure or triply sure. Well, if it violates the law, it is a problem because policy cannot override law. It does not violate the law because the law does not prohibit the Attorney General from consulting his, his or her advisor. And the Solicitor General is the advisor to the Attorney General. Solicitor <laughs> Mr. Singate, I wish to defer on that point because the law is clear. So we should have just talked to what the law said. I disagree. Uh, I will leave it to the Commission to draw conclusions on that issue. I would like us to move to the next point, which is talk about the interference of investigations and prosecutions by the former president. By issuing executive directives. We have several communications here that show that letters emanated from the Office of the President to your office. Is it correct to say before this commission that that was a trend? What trend are you talking about? Executive directives being sent to your office for implementation. 
Yes, the executive is vested with executive powers. So yes, we do receive executive director, di directives. Wow, then in the job I indigal you get coach president. That more meter men rango na doale bo hamne ni muna jo indigal ni de kuko. Does he also have the power to sack magistrates and judges? That more meter men president me amon na doale pull dah I magistrate ag I judge I attacked. Yes, he did. Wow. Only when they did judgments that he wasn't happy with that were not in his favor telolé daf ko dey def jamana jo xamé né nak def nañ dogal bo xamné mom dal doyut ko that is not within my knowledge ah lo na dout ci lo xamné ni xamna ko dé if i may show you this letter ma hara ma won la letter bi which is dated the 6th of november 2015 you ron benn fan wéri november 2015 and it is from the office of the president by the secretary general dé mo ngi bayé ko office president bi it is headed extremely urgent and the subject matter is court dismissal for lack of jurisdiction at Birkama Magistrate Court. Does it ring any bell? No. Mr. Chair, with your permission, I'd like to show the witness the letter. Thank you. Is it correct to say that this is an executive directive from the office of the president directed to your office? Mun nañu wax ne dey li cadre la go xamne mo nga baye ko ci office president bi ñu ebal ci ko sa office yow. Yes, it was a letter from the office office of the president sent to my office. Wow, letter la bo xam joge ko ci office president bi ñu ebal ko ci suma office. And it is correct that in this letter there was a directive. Ya mun nañu wax ne ci letter bi tamit amna dogal bo xamne ma amna ci to dismiss a magistrate because the executive were not happy with the decision he made and this letter was during the time when you were minister i just thought i'd bring it to your attention to show that executive directives did come from the office of the president I have another letter dated the 24th of March 2015. And it is to do with a particular case where the executive wanted charges to be pressed. Can I show you the letter? Yes, please. With your permission, Mr. Chair. And with permission, Mr. Chair, I would like the witness to read out the letter. Should I? Okay, this is a letter that is dated on the 24th of March, addressed to the Attorney General. The letter is dated on the 24th of March, addressed to the Attorney General. And it is signed by the Secretary General. And it reads, I invite Reverend Steward Ibrahim Kanyo to sign this letter. The letter is dated on the 24th of March, addressed to the Attorney General. And it reads, I invite Reverend Steward Ibrahim Kanyo to sign this letter. Reference number in indicated. Uh, reference number when you bind the Of March 10th, 2015. Lujem fuki March atum 2015. On the above and hereby convey executive directive. Te temen nak di agal indigal bo hamne mugi joge kochi president bi. To the effect that your office should rectify the error in respect of the charges against one Mr. De Simon Sandro. Ne sen te sen office warna nyor deferat jumte bo hamne ni amna chi. And should be tried again under the appropriate charges. Yes. And it was minuted to DPP 
Please work on this directive urgently, signed Solicitor General, 23rd March 2015. Et je solicite général général de la de la DPP de la DPP It's still an office. I am putting it to you that the letter was directly addressed to you to take action. It was addressed to the office of the Attorney General. In the absence of Attorney General, the Solicitor General minuted it to the DPP. That's not my signature, that's the Solicitor General's signature, then which shows. Then, could be known to Office Attorney General, be she the duty of not. Solicitor General B. Momoko Moko Lini. That's in a boom gag is for do so much in a so much in sign. Miss Singate, this goes to show that directives were being sent to your office. Leader for one and I'm not a legal you done by a coach beating your office. Whilst you were the minister, the Kayaneka minister, and they were being implemented. It was your responsibility to supervise and look over everything that was done in that office whilst you were the minister. May I say something? You may. So I said that it was signed by the solicitor, solicitor General, which shows how important it is to consult the Solicitor General when we're working on criminal cases. Because in my absence, he acts on my behalf. So that signature on it is not mine, it's the Solicitor General's signature. And yes, I agree with you that my, the minister, when I was in office, I had oversight responsibility. But the minister is not God who can see everything and hear everything. That's why he, she or he has an abled Solicitor General. And that's why, in my absence, the Solicitor General acts. Yes, in any event, such a letter should not be emanating from the president's office by the direction of the president to institute or direct the attorney general as to what charges or how they should charge a person. So it is irrelevant as to who minuted the letter or who received and took action on the letter. The letter itself is improper. Actually, the letter is fine. I say so because Because section 76 vests of the constitution vests the president with executive powers. Just a minute, I'm here. Bishop, you, uh, you want to raise a point of order? Yes, indeed. I, I just want to say so. Um, I want to believe that uh, uh, the matter in question is whether or not executive directives were received by the um, Minister of Justice and Antony General. That was I think never that's, 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 the, that's the thing that we need to have an answer, whether that um, executive directives used to come from the presidency to the um, Antony General's chamber. Uh, what's the point of order? Yeah, because the fact is um, we are being drawn back to say that, um, well, it, it was the Solicitor General that you know, acted on behalf of the Antony General, and it was the Solicitor General that signed uh, you know, the executive order um, uh, directing the DPP to take action. 
I think that's not the, that's not the answer we're looking for. The question is, um, executive orders comes from the office of the president to uh, the attorney general and uh, the minister of justice. And that is what we want to get clarification on, I think. I never denied that. I said yes, we received letters from OP to the Ministry of Justice. And I even went further. And I was actually going further that section 76 of the constitution vests the president with executive powers. With executive powers. So if he chooses to send executive directives or letters to the ministry or any other ministry, it's his prerogative. Minister of Justice. I'm sorry, I forgot it was Bishop that asked the question. <laughs> but it is a follow-up to my question, and I differ with your answer. The president does not have the right to give an executive directive on matters of prosecution. But then it worries me now that this was the belief. Because then it goes to prove to show why there were so many people who were recommended for prosecution by an executive directive from the president. And they were implemented. That's not true. The reason why I say so, Every case that is prosecuted is prosecuted for a reason and a co in accordance to law. Uh, Every letter that comes as an executive directive has a context. Uh, so that means the letter should not be seen in isolation. Uh, it referred to a letter that was sent to that office. Perhaps council would like to share that letter that was referred to in the executive directive. I also want to add that the president is vested with powers to address issues of national concern. President bi ranga nañ ko ak doole pour nak mu garal mbir mo xamne ni depo nak walli rew rew mi. Bi it economic interest mo xam muy ajo ci walli kom kom security interest wala ci walli karange or public interest wala li nga xamne moy jeri nit ñi. So everything has to be seen in context of that executive directive. E kon nak bor bu ne rek war nañ ko sété ci li nga xamne ni ëmbu na ko nak di ndigal bobu joggé ko ci mom. And to go for the my role as attorney general. Té continuer di dem li nga xamne ni mo nekkon su may sata ni attorney general. As principal legal advisor. E ki nga xamne ni may aju ci cadeau yelef ci rew mi. Is to provide advice to the government who is headed by the president and the cabinet. So where executive directives are not in accordance to law, there's an opinion that goes to explain why they are not in accordance to law. And if you go through the files, you will see my opinions there. There are plenty. And I know when it comes to writing, no one writes better than me. Or as much as I do. I had files in that, in that ministry 
I'm not a file to ministry bo ranging from OP to executive directive to judiciary to every department any time that requires my opinion to be written I write it eh di ndigal mo xam nak ndigal yo xam joge ko na ci president dem ci judiciary wala ci yenen bunta say bo xam ne ni ajo nañ suma xelat rek dana ko fa bind that is my mandate and my responsibility lolu moy suma mandat ak lolu suma warugal whether they are accepted whether the advices are accepted that's not within my control that's within the prerogative of the ministry responsible or the ministry it was addressed to or the office of the president it was addressed to and that's the fact and as lawyers we all know this we act on instructions we give advice we have no control whether the clients accept the advice or not Missing you are yes. taking this way out of context. Yaya Jame was not your client. He was the president. My own president. And he should have done things by the law. It is not good procedure. It is against the law for the president to target people and base it on executive powers for them to be tried, convicted. We cannot accept that. May I respond? Yeah, it wasn't for response, it was a statement. But I need to clarify the fact that I never said that I was President Jame's lawyer. I said I was a lawyer for government and President Jame is the head of government. So government is an entity and there has to be a head and a focal person. And I dealt with the solicitor Secretary General and the Secretary General related my messages and my, in my opinions to the President. So I'm not the President's lawyer, but I am the lawyer for the government who is headed by the President in accordance with the Constitution of the Gambia. President be more head of Gurbi. Gurbi. The president be not more more jiting Gurbi. Pardon my. We're not. It's okay if you want to clarify the interpretation. There's no problem with that. We're okay with that statement. But you went further on to say that the relationship between a client and a lawyer. Even with clients and lawyers, I think lawyers do not act on illegal instructions. So as lawyers, we really have to avert our minds to that. So the president did not have any right over any other citizen to send directives for persons to be prosecuted and eventually convicted and sentenced. Just to also clarify, I never took any illegal instructions. Every action I, I took was done in accordance with the laws of the Gambia. So long as it's in the law books, it's the valid law. Let it repeal or declared unconstitutional. We will get to that point, missing Ati. Don't worry. We will get there. Please allow him to, to translate as well, please. Please, Mr. Translator, please translate that. Well, let me take you straight on then. You remember the case of Mr. Usain Udabo? Yes. Can well, you tell us about that matter? I cannot at the top of my head. He was arrested, correct? Yes, with well. other persons who were also in his category, sort of elderly. Is that correct? I cannot confirm or deny that. I don't know. All right, well, that is correct information. 
And this matter was in 2016. And you've made certain statements on that matter. I believe the Bar Association had paid you a visit when the matter had just started. Do you remember that conversation? No, but I'm sure you'll remind me. They had indicated that there's no need for excessive force or for the detention of the persons who were arrested with Mr. Dabo because they were elderly in some form and that they should be released. Do you remember that conversation? No, but I'm sure you would elaborate. Okay. I believe you stated that the act they committed was against the laws of the Gambia. Is that correct? No. I don't recall, but if that's what that what it says, then it must be because the act they committed was definitely against the law of the Gambia. At that point, though, one day entitled to bail. Of course. Wow. It's a bailable offense, is it not? Isn't it also correct that you received executive directives from President Yaya Jammeh then to prosecute and pay special attention to this matter? I don't recall that one. Wasn't it also correct that there was interference with the judiciary to ensure that they did not grant them bail? That's not within my knowledge because I know I did not interfere with the judiciary to deny them bail. Everybody is entitled to bail if the offense is bailable. Isn't it also correct that you advised the DPP to oppose bail? No, that, that's not true. Well, that is the information we have. That's a false information. And in any event, the DPP did oppose bail, even though it was a bailable offense. Isn't that correct? I am not aware of that. Okay. Being, being the overall seer of that office, you should have been aware of that matter. I am and not you in court with DPP. I am not in court with DPP. You should have advised the DPP not to oppose the bail in that application. Okay. Perhaps what you need to understand. Uh, once the opinions have been approved for prosecution, it remains within the purview of the DPP to exercise its discretion in the case. I did not and I have not micromanaged the DPP. If a matter is bailable, obviously anybody is entitled to bail. Mr. Ngake. I can tell you that I did not instruct DPP either way. And I am the one case, on the oath. That case, I am always on the oath. <laughs> Let's not go I'm just that saying, I'm just, because it's my testimony, it's my evidence. On that case, it was a high profile case. The whole world knew about it, not only the country, the whole world knew about it. And it was a case that was under your ministry. 
Under your watch, it was being prosecuted. The whole world knew that Hussein Odaba and others were denied bail, even though the matter was bailable. I believe as the advisor. To government and as the AG responsible for that ministry that was pursuing the matter. You should have advised the DPP to withdraw his opposition to the bail application. I will leave that to the commission to yeah, analyze. Go ahead, do that. In the same vein, in that conversation with the Bar Association, when they had indicated that they would be issuing out a public statement, you still don't remember that conversation? I do not. I'm yeah. surprised. You had indicated that if the bar members go ahead, they would be arrested. That is completely and utterly false. And it's outrageous. It's absurd. I don't have the power to arrest and I would never. That's not even my language. And I would be happy to hear who said that. Since it's a false allegation against me. Miss Singate, at that time you were really interested in getting Dabo and others convicted. That is absolutely false. And for, my, for your information and for the information of the commissioners and members of the public, that case was prosecuted according to law. He was convicted according to law. That conviction was upheld by the Supreme Court of the Gambia according to law. So this issue of what I said or what I did not say is, is, here, is neither here or there. But I can say this for the record. I don't recall and I do not believe I did have that conversation with the Bar Association much more threaten them with arrest. That's not within my purview, that's not in my nature, and I did not have the power to do that. And let it be on record as well. Uh, at that time, all you were looking at was to please Yaya Jame and get convictions. My job is not to please the president. My job is to advise on the law. That uh, is what I did. And for the record, the, the opinion to, uh, to, to prosecute in that matter, the, the opinion was independently drafted by counsel in the DPP's office. And the council is alive and well. He can testify that nobody pressured him. And DPP approved the opinion. And the opinion was endorsed by the authority of the ministry. By the Solicitor General, to be precise. Solicitor General, And I agree with the, with his approval. Let that be for the record as well. Mr. Ngata, there was a system in place that was created by Yaya Jame and his people that worked with him. And this system involved institutions such as the NIA, police, etc. 
and further it involved your office in the latter years of this country where Yaijame ruled we had the worst human rights record that anybody could imagine and this was under your watch as the Minister of Justice. Let it be on record that I was not used by anybody. I cannot be used by anybody. I refer you to the matter of Samsudin Conte. Do you remember that issue of his sacking? I do not. Well, it was brought to your attention by the executive. And they had indicated that it be facilitated that he be terminated because of a decision he had given of a no case submission. And you facilitated that. That cannot be true. I did not hire Mr. the, the magistrate you mentioned. Neither was he working under me. So I could not have facilitated that. Mr. Ngati, I see you want this commission to believe that there was a normal system of running your office and the government and other institutions. Yes, it was normal. It was normal. Perhaps your own perception is abnormal, but my, the way I saw it during my time there, what is within my knowledge, it was a normal system done in accordance to law. The ministry was within my control. Ministry was And I can tell you that everything I did that was within my control was done according to law. I have no control over what anybody else does. I have control over what I do. And what I do is always in accordance with law. Singate, I disagree with that. And I will draw the Commission's attention again to the, to the issues of the executive directive that we had discussed earlier. Further, I would also want to draw the Commission's attention to the interference in the judiciary, etc., by your office. I would like examples, please. Uh, I already gave you some examples. That's, that, that's, that's, that, that's not uh, an authoritative example because I did not have any interference with the judiciary. I had played no role in the work of the judiciary. That's yes. not within my mandate. It's not within my purview. Uh, yes. To give you an example of another matter, do you remember the case of the state versus Ansumana Jame, etc.? Can you elaborate? He was arraigned before the court and a bail sum of 100 million dollars was granted by the court. Was granted by the court. Do you remember the action you took? Remind me. Okay. Isn't it correct that you personally spoke to President Yaya Jame to reduce the amount of the bail? That is absurd. 
Why would I ask him to reduce the amount of the bill? He's not a judge. Ah, lor de doi na war na kala lan mo ta mai wa mu wani alaman bo unon linte eti wa li bill bi da mo dur atekat bi. That just goes back to show you that the president was involved in everything. No, no, that's more like what the president be mom. That's why I do go look up to Luneka. And the way you describe the ministry. And indicating that under the constitution he had executive powers to direct. It tends to show that he received the wrong advice and which enabled him to interfere into matters that he shouldn't have. That's absolutely false. Well, it is before this commission and we know that Yai Jame was involved in all sectors of the government. All sectors, including the Attorney General's chambers. And just to let you know that this matter also showed that at times you did personally get involved in, judici in judici judicial matters. What matter are you referring to? The Ansumana Jame. I do not agree with you. Can you elaborate? Because yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Mm. I have finished on that point. No, the allegations are false. Seriously, you can't just be making conclusions without even giving explanation for your conclusions. The commission but I can state for the record, I do not interfere in the judicial, in the activities of the judiciary. I have great respect for the judiciary because I used to be one of them. The way I did not want to be treated, I would never treat my colleagues that way. And let that be for the record as well. Is it correct that you were the minister on the 8th of May 2014? My mandate expired in August in 2014. So you were the minister at that time? So it goes to, for, it goes, it goes to show that I was the minister at that time. Do you remember giving an interview to New Africa magazine? about the Universal Periodic Report, Review Report to the UN Human Rights Council. Vaguely. Can you tell us what you remember? I remember meeting with the lady from New, uh, New Africa, the 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 New Africa paper or New Africa report. Is it correct to say that you were happy to meet with her and tell her that you were eager to attend the meeting and submit the report? The Universal Periodic Report? Yes. Yes. I don't recall, but sounds right. And you further went on to say to her that when it comes to human rights, we promote and protect the rights of everybody. Sounds right. And this was in 2014. If you say so. At this time, we know that Gambia's record on human rights was poorly. You further went on to say in your interview, the message is that we support human rights, 
We promote and protect everybody's rights. But unfortunately, what we hear about in the press in the rights is of those who committed offenses. The criminals who committed murder. When we punish them, all we hear about is those people who are fighting for the rights of the murderers. What about the rights of the victims? Is this the message you took to the UN? I did not attend the UNUPR. But that's what I believe. As a prosecutor, I used to be a prosecutor. And we used to prosecute murder suspects. And we used to see the deceased and the family, the diseases family, as victims of the violation of their rights, the, the, the family members' rights to life. When we do prosecute those cases. At this time, that was the in context May, I was made. That was the context. And because in this day and age, when you apprehend and prosecute a person, the only thing you hear about is the violation of the rights of the person being prosecuted. But we always need to remember there's always a victim behind the, pro the prosecution of the person, the alleged perpetrator. And that's what we must remember. And let me also say for the record, I'm not denying that Gambia had human rights issues. I would be pretending, I'd be fooling myself if I thought that we had a perfect human rights record. But no country in this world has a perfect human rights record. Mr. Singata, we're talking about the Gambia. No, please, please, let me finish. We have an obligation we, as government officials to continue to do better and advocate for better, and I did that. I'm sorry. In cabinet and in public. And we used to have a political dialogue with the EU. Under the Cotonou Agreement, where we will meet EU ambassadors twice every year and discuss about the human rights record of the Gambia. And I'm always the first to admit that yes, we can do and we should do better. But what I find very concerning is that foreigners would come and tell us about the human rights situation in the Gambia. When we had our own lawyers and so-called civil society organizations within the country, who would stay mute and not say anything or draw any human rights violation to our attention. And then go to the press and start crying foul for the violation of somebody's rights. And as the Minister of Justice, most of the so-called violation that occurred was never within my knowledge. It would have been nice for these things to be brought to my attention. 
by my colleagues and so-called human rights defenders. If they did not see it fit to petition the Minister of Justice, they could have walked into my office because I had an open-door policy. The same way they used to come to my office to help to ask me to assist them with cases that they had. Where their, where their clients were in a difficulty. Where their clients were paying them a lot of money. To walk into my office to plead on their behalf. That's the same way I believe they should have walked into my office to, to talk about the human rights violation or alleged human rights violation that they saw, they observed, or they heard. So that I would fulfill my mandate as Attorney General to provide the relevant advice to the necessary department concerned. So I find it very rich that I am seated here. That I'm being accused of being an enabler or being part to whatever that was going wrong. Missing that, I don't think anyone said you were an enabler. When this yet. was never brought to my attention. So this is a truth commission. Let's talk the truth. Are you done? Oh yes, for now. Thank you. I thought I should be leading the questions, but it seems to have turned. Uh, For a minute there, I thought it was Yaya Jame who was actually talking to us. Talking about why do the foreigners or the non-Gambians, etc., come to tell us about our human rights record. Our human rights record was bad. It was one of the worst. And you were aware. And as the minister, you should have advised against against such activities of people being detained. When we say detained, people being picked up and taken directly to mile two. People being beaten and tortured at NIA. You did not need anyone to come and tell you. You knew about them. And you should have done the right thing and taken action. Because as the AG, you are there for the people of the Gambia and not for the government. Going back to the article. When it was mentioned that the human rights of the Gambia was highly violated, they were talking about people who were unlawfully arrested, people who were detained at mile two without any court order or having been taken before a court of law. People who were disappeared. People who were unlawfully killed. And that should have shown in this report. And not to talk about actual criminals who have committed an offense. And face the law. Moving on, you continue. You were part of a committee that was established. 
that was responsible for prison conditions, etc. Is that correct? No, it's not correct. Were you part of a committee that looked at the issues of the prisons? I don't recall. I don't think so. Well, the information I have is you were a member of the prisons committee. I am not. I was not. Then I will leave it and move on from that. We move on to the tax commission of 2011. It is correct that a tax commission was set up to look into the evasion of taxes and corrupt practices. Is that correct? And you, sorry, and you were heading that commission as the chairperson. That is correct. Can you enlighten the com the, this commission about the commission for the tax evasion? So a commission of inquiry was established in 2011. Uh, commission of inquiry, the guest in 2011. Via legal instruments. Contained in a legal notice that was gazetted. Which I'm sure you're familiar with because that's the same way your commission was established. So the commission was the full name of the commission. May I read it? Commission of Inquiry into Tax Evasion. And other corrupt practices. Of accountants, legal practitioners, engineers, medical practitioners, companies, and private persons, and institutions required to pay tax to the Gambia Revenue Authority. And you cannot be over 75 years old. So at the time I was appointed, I was a judge. I had over five years what was called experience. And I, I was not over 40 years old. <laughs> Much more to say 70 years old. So when the commission was established, I was invited, I was informed by a letter from the Office of the Attorney General at the time to inform me that I was appointed as chairperson of this newly established commission called the tax commission two, two other persons were appointed as commissioners one was a economist the other was an accountant ACCA and he was also an auditor as well on tax issues. So the mandate of the commission 
was to inquire into the incidence and dimension of tax evasion and avoidance. Asserting the extent of the loss of public revenue resulting from capital gains tax. Personal income tax. Sales tax. And determine the role of individuals. Groups and professional bodies. In the evasion and avoidance of tax. So in my view, when I read this mandate, requ what this requirement of what was expected of the tax commission, I understood it to mean an inquiry into, the, into everybody's um, role in the payment of tax. Particularly professional bodies. Companies, private persons and institutions. But to my mind, the rule was very broad. The mandate was very broad. So the, okay, I don't, I, let me yeah. just cut let it me, short. Let me ask questions to follow up on what you would want to say okay. anyway. It was seen that there was a selection of persons who appeared before the commission. Is that correct? No. Did it? If you read the report, you would see that there was a system that was in place. That's what I was going to get at, missing out. That's why there were certain categories of people who were called before the commission. Not everybody was called. Isn't that correct? The whole country was not called, true. But the fact that you say a category, especially when I've already listed out the list of people that were, bound, that were under the mandate of the tax commission, I couldn't understand why you said category. Yeah, How many no lawyers were called before that commission? Let me, answer, let me say this. Yeah. When the tax commission started its work, yeah. yes. can you answer my question no, first? I, the reason why I'm saying this, because we're treading on a very dangerous path here. Well, this is the truth commission. It's the truth commission, but it's also a commission. And I also headed a commission. So it's not fair, neither, neither is it right, to inquire into the affairs of a commission that has already been con concluded. Yeah. When the man, yes, carry on with the interpretation. When the mandate of the commission expired, uh, the commission prepared a report and submitted it to the executive. Through the Ministry of Justice that contacted them. The report consisted of... I would love you to answer my question. If question, you cannot answer it, you indicate that you cannot answer the question. I am answering your question. It's just that you're, I'm not answering the way you want me to answer it. My question was, how many lawyers were called to appear before that commission? I cannot tell you at the top of my head it's in the report. So perhaps you. you might guide me if you have how the report many before businesses, you. How many business entities were were called to appear before that commission. It's in the report. I cannot tell you at the top of my head, but if you read the report, you would know. Yeah. But it, but it is correct that there was a select of lawyers and also a select of companies that appeared before the commission. And the reasons for that decision was also explained in that report. I will get to that. Okay.
if you stop being so defensive, you <laughs> might get where I'm getting to. No, I, yes. I'm sorry I will, if I will you get think to that, that I'm defensive. Yes. Okay. What was the reasoning behind not all the lawyers being called to this commission? Again, I cannot talk about the, the, the workings of the commission and the reasoning behind the commission. Because not only are you creating a precedent, it's not right. Once the Commission of Inquiry completed its work, its mandate had expired. There's no law that says that anybody should ask any commissioner or chairperson about the content of the report and require an explanation about the content of the report. Because to ask about the activities of the report. I will move so that we, we don't waste the time of the commission. Okay, no, no, but let the, let the, since you're talking to the public, let's talk all talk to the public and the members of the commissioner, commission. We need to understand why. Once the work of a commission is completed, and that includes this year, Truth Commission, and every other commission, the mandate of the commissioners have expired. So it is not right for anybody to call up the commissioners again and ask them about the activities of a commission of inquiry, which, the, which has produced a report that is public, to, it's in Mr. public Gade, record. I will move forward, but I differ with that. There is no problem in me asking the, I, who I, were the people called to appear before the commission. There's no it's problem. public knowledge. I agree with you, there's no problem, yes. but it will lead to problems. So, so the better we, thing to do is to avoid it completely. May we move on? No problem, I agree. You have already indicated that a report was done and submitted. Yes. When you finished your work at the commission, did you return back to be a judge? Yes. yes. How long was that before you were appointed Attorney General? I completed my work in March. In 2012, in 2012, and I was appointed minister in August 2013. A new minister very August 2013. So that was over a year. Is it therefore correct to say that at the time you were at the ministry, the recommendations of that commission were being implemented. Yes, they were being implemented before I even got to the to the ministry. But you got to the ministry and the implementation was continuing. I got into the ministry where the implementation was ongoing. When you became minister, you now took over responsibility of all the files in the ministry. I became responsible for all the files in the ministry, but I expressly requested and instructed the Solicitor General to take over all tax commission files. Because I felt that it was a conflict of interest and I, didn't want, I did not want to deal with the tax commission anyway. Ms. Singate, is it also correct that Almost everybody that appeared before that commission filed an appeal against the findings. And that is the way it's supposed to be. Everybody has a right to appeal to any adverse findings made against them. And is it also correct that most of those appeals were upheld by the Court of Appeal to state that the findings were incorrect? 
I cannot comment on that, but I know that there were a lot of consent terms agreements that were that were filed. Munuma was lulu bari de nda huwa amna na juu bari yoka bde mugi jamchi file yo linga kama ni lulu ni amu. And consent and was consent terms is the agreement between the Attorney General's Office and the person who against whom the adverse findings were made. So that means both agreed, and the court adopted that agreement as the judgment of the court. Di nango to yoka bde ni mugi dopo Attorney General bi linga kama ni nyonyo eh fara sen birio ino ni chile chile ni nko tete kodba lo la jel te te me mudon dogal Mr. Kate you see if you listen to my questions we'll agree so de glo suma la te bide di na ni anda there were two sets nyari fana la there was one where parties actually won the appeal berna bi moy ni nga hamne nyonyo and the findings were set aside ak benen bi nga hamne nko tege bo and there was the other set where there were consent terms. And even considering the consent terms, the amounts were reduced in the fact that the findings were not correct. If you say so. Thank you. Mr. Chair, at this point, may we take the second break? and continue when we come back. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, Council, and thank you, Madam Singati. We will um, uh, resume at uh, 2.30 sharp. Meetings adjourned. They say we slept in one world and woke up in another. 